187 review and thoughts. Now, I start this video with a review with no spoilers. Certainly, if I spoil anything, I will warn before I do so. And hold up an index finger until I'm done with spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me go on my index finger. But as soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. And Los Angeles, an urban high school teacher, Garfield, placed by, played by Samuel Jackson, an idealist, very devoted, tries to make the lessons very memorable rather than just reading a book, memorizing things. He struggles to teach the students due to a local gang. And even though some of them are clearly dangerous, the administration is more worried about a lawsuit. And, you know, one of the students already attacked someone and was forced to stay in the school instead of being put in a more secure facility which is obviously deeply messed up. It's engaging, and then partway through the movie, spoiling when, at an hour and three minutes in and for the rest of the movie. No more spoilers. Something truly magical happens that you almost have to see to believe, and I'll talk about it in the notes taken before watching section from near the start of it, so if you cannot wait go you know feel free to skip ahead to that because it's it's wild now if this is a movie you've never heard of it's a drama thriller released in 1997 directed by kevin reynolds known for waterworld and robin hood prince of thieves i rewatched prince of thieves just a few days ago it's a good reminder that having michael wincott in your movie makes it at least a good 30 to 40 percent better and that Alan Rickman always made for a fun villain, R.I.P. And it is trying to depict the difficulty of teaching at an urban high school. I will absolutely criticize some of the actions by teachers in this video. So before I do that, I want to make it absolutely clear. I have the utmo uh, utmost respect for teachers, especially ones dealing with students that are a challenge. My parents were both teachers until they retired, and yeah, I know that their job and life is much harder than a lot of people give them credit for. So, you know, let me just briefly break from, if you, in real life, if you're trying to judge, please try to see it from the teacher's point of view. They have an extremely hard job. It's very, very exhausting, and... Yeah, you know, I'm I'm not saying that there are no bad teachers out there, but at first, at least, try to give them the benefit of the doubt, hear their side of the story. I'm sorry, but your kid is not perfect. They might behave better when you're watching them than when other adults are watching them. That's not a pleasant thing to think about, but it is true. Please listen to the teacher. Try to see if what they're saying could possibly be, you know, excuse me. So anything I say in this video that criticizes teachers, please know I have a lot of empathy for their situation. I mean, for sure, I couldn't be a teacher myself, even though about half the time my father talks about teaching, he said that I should become a teacher, giving reasons such as there will always be a need for teachers. Part of the reason I know that I wouldn't be able to do it is that the other half of the time when he's talking about it, he says that he wish he hadn't been a teacher and how awful it is. He's a complicated man. No one understands him, but is one. And I also have a lot of empathy for those living in bad neighborhoods, regardless of their ethnicity and, you know, uh, sorry, what's that say? Huh. Oh, no, I, sorry. I should have proofread more of these notes than I evidently got around to. I empathize with anyone of any ethnicity, regardless of the neighborhood they live in. And sadly, at times, the movie somewhat feels like it thinks that if you're a youth and you're not white, you're a stupid, disruptive student who's likely to be dangerous. 
Now, there are a lot of details that help flesh out the environment, and some of the plot twists are hard to believe. But yeah, the you know the people who made this put in really good work. Sam Jackson's performance is great, as usual. Sometimes the approach they go for is not the most fitting. It is fairly well directed. And let's see. I you know, if I wasn't already a huge fan of Clifton Collins Jr., this movie would have made me a fan. You know, I when I think of him, I mostly think of the rules. I cannot believe I'm blanking on the name of that movie right now. One second. Unreal. I'm sorry. I swear I will not take long. I have the IMDb app. I'll search for him and very quickly find it. And while I'm doing it, I will try to avoid there being any dead air. I would say that Kelly Rowan, I think I would also really be, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if I've seen her, and actually, I did. No, I don't think, I don't think I've seen her in anything else. This would make, and honestly, uh, John Hurd also does a pretty good job in this. Let's see, so Cliff. There we go. And he Right, yeah, he's he's in traffic. Uh, let's see, it's here somewhere. Getting closer, I can tell. Right, he's also great in Crank High Voltage, of course. But yeah, the, the movie I especially think... Oh, that's right, Grand Theft Auto, yeah. Uh, sorry, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Is the, name. the Rules of Attraction, there it is, sorry. That's the one I most think of. As, uh, yeah, you know, actually, yeah. If you watch this movie and you want to see more of him, I recommend that. And uh, you know, yeah, Crank High Voltage. I honestly, it's been years since I watched Traffic, but I figure he's probably great in it. And yeah, but the the opening of the movie is it does a good job of like. First, we have a little bit of atmospheric kind of, you know, we, we get the sense of, you know, at the start of the movie, Garfield works in New York. And, yeah, you know, you get a sense of what New York is like. And then you have the attack on Garfield, which is really, you know, legitimately incredibly dramatic and, yeah. The ending wants to be inspiring, but it doesn't really work for reasons that I'll get into in the notes taken before watching section. I'm not going to be spoiling the ending, don't worry, in, in this section. It doesn't really lose your interest along the way. It definitely, you, you change your perspective on the movie along the way, but it doesn't lose your interest. And you, you really get that, yeah, Garfield badly wants to teach. He is passionate about giving these kids a future. And some of the students do want to learn, and others make that very difficult. And... Yeah, and to briefly... the the Yeah, so this is from some... You know, others have noted in their reviews. The story is overwhelmed by the exotic, colorful psychos who rule Garfield's classroom. Yeah, they are maybe a little too... Yeah, I, th I think that's a good... And another review said that all of the characters are overwritten. Yeah, may maybe. It's, it's not the best writing. 
the direction does a pretty decent job at getting the most out of the writing. And Yeah, and, and Sam Jackson is impeccable, and his particular knack for playing someone who holds anger and may lose control is really excellent for this. You really get that he's, yeah. And... And yeah, and this is from an MDB user review. A jewel in this movie is the performance of Clifton Collins, Collins as Cesar Sanchez. He shows the depth of anger. And the... Yeah, the movie does a good job of showing how disruptive some students can be. And... This is one of the, the movies where, you know, you see how some of the characters behave when at their best and when at their lowest, which is a, a really good way to characterize uh, characters. You know, I've, I've always said that you, you never learn more about someone than when you see them on their worst day. On the, yeah. And, yeah, so the, the... Yeah, the, the editing and cinematography are incredible, but they are dangerously close to being flashy. And yeah, this is from another view. The story is overwhelmed by the music video aesthetic. New York scenes are shot in cold blues and grays, while the LA sequences are a hazy, burnt out yellow. And, and there's, you know, there are a few times where something is blurry and out of focus because Garfield himself is having trouble full, fully and properly perceiving the world around him due to the trauma of the attack early on. This, Yeah, there's especially some early on. I think I saw some reviewers say that it, they think the blurry stuff goes too far. I don't think so. I do think that the, the color grading is... They should have toned that down. I can help it. They should have tone that down a little bit, but the, like, color, tone, sorry, if you need to explain the joke, the, the, but, but yeah, you know, the, the blurring is very intentional, I, I think I read that some, I forget if it was someone who actually thought that there was something wrong with the, you know, when they watched it in the theater, if there was something wrong with the projector, or they said that some people might think that that's what is going on, but, I could, I could understand that, yeah. I do think that it's very, like, it's not like it's a lot of the movie, and it's very effective when it's there, and it makes perfect sense. It really, like, yeah. So the, let's see. Yeah. And the, there are very few special effects, and that was the right choice. There are not a lot of stunts, but what they have is quite good. It's very convincing. You know, the the it's that thing of if your if your stunt work is good, it doesn't look like stunts. You know, it looks invisible. It the the viewer is tricked into believing that that actually happened, and yeah, they managed to do that very nicely. I there's there's a little bit of stuff in this movie where it's like. That had to be a stunt. That's there's no way they did that with just yeah. You know, and it, yeah, it's very convincing. Yeah, to, to finish that sentence. I know logically it had to be a stunt, but when I just watch it, it feels like it's not. And the movie does a good job capturing the physical environment, and it gets very tense at times very psychologically disturbing at times, and the relationship between the, you know, yeah, our antagonist and the relationship between our protagonist and antagonist, very, very memorable. And let's see. And the movie is very easy to follow. There, there are a few things left 
somewhat up to interpretation. And yeah, the the there's at least one reviewer who said the story is overwhelmed by the throbbing score. And another said that the photography and score are excellent because they reflect the depressive and hopeless situation perfectly. And yeah. And and yet one more review points out that the trip hop score fits the urban environment. The movie doesn't have a lot of, like, humor. I, I don't think it would have worked. It wouldn't have fit. The, the tone is fairly... There's, there's not a lot of hope in the movie. And a lot of jokes would have... You know, you, usually when there's someone making a joke, it's one of the students showing disrespect, basically. M making jokes instead of answering properly. Now, let's see. But yeah, as like a drama, thriller, you know, urban movie, it, it's pretty good. I've seen better, but it's, it's effective. I have not watched Dangerous Minds, but as far as I know, you know, that movie is probably, it's, that's probably the movie that's most similar to this. I've heard that that one's better than this, and yeah, at, at least a few of the other movies like this are better than this. I would definitely say that, you know, there, there are some major differences between this and Stand and Deliver, but I would say Stand and Deliver is overall better than this. Now, the movie has some moderate bloody violence, some of which is meant to be cathartic, and some of it is meant to be disturbing. And the tone is gritty, but at times melodramatic. And the movie is an hour and 49 minutes without any credits, 54 with them. You know, if you follow the movie past the ship it goes through that I mentioned earlier, then it's worth sitting it through the rest. But if it loses you, again, it's not, it's not that you lose interest, but it might make you not really want to watch the rest of it you know like a like um yeah like if you're watching something and it's just it's going in a way that you don't like sometimes it's better to just not watch it you know you know but yeah you might as well stop watching unless you just want to see how far it's going to go it's i'm not sure i would call it generic or unique it's it's somewhere in between <clears throat> Honestly, the second half of the movie is incredible, although not for the reason they wanted it to be. And yeah, if if you you know if you like the movie early on, you might not like it past the the shift. But if you like it when it starts shifting, you're definitely going to want to watch for the rest of it. Yeah, if you really like the first half, then the second half might be really, really unappealing to you. Now, let's see. I... Let's see. Right, and the... Yeah, so I give this seven powerful Sam Jackson performances out of ten. And that is it for the spoiler-free segment. So, spoilers from here on out. As we get into the thoughts section, for the first section, disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice via the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of it is very standard information. 
I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section once I get into the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. And yeah, so here, here on out, spoilers for this entire movie, so don't say I didn't warn you. And let's see. But yeah, from... Still, if I spoil anything else, I will warn verbally and I'll hold up an index finger until I'm done spoiling. So you can mute and skip ahead. And let's see. Yeah, so content warning and or trigger warning. I am going to be discussing the potentially triggering content of this movie, Russian Roulette and murder and I guess yeah mutilation you know when the finger gets cut off and that whole thing yeah yeah I don't have a problem with the violence and gore in general I think it's one of my favorite horror movies the movie in general I also love Cronenberg's The Flying Video Drum etc and yeah personally I don't think it's wrong to put violence in fiction Except for the following exceptions. If it could encourage xenophobia, could make people think that violence is a solution in real life, there are almost no problems that it solves in real life. And yes, that does in fact mean that I take issue with some of the violence in this movie. Because the movie basically paints it as righteous, cathartic. And I don't have a problem with film sexuality and nudity, disturbing or upsetting material in general. Since Monster is one of my favorite movies, and The, the only way, in my opinion, the only way sex can be wrong is if consent is violated and or it's cheating. I do think there are very, relatively few situations where rape should appear in fiction. Ideally, you should explore what rape does to survivors. It should not be erotic, funny, or throwaway. It should not be in the movie simply to motivate a man to get revenge for someone raping one of his loved ones. I guess it depends on how you read it whether or not Rita is being raped. No, wait, yeah, actually, so, uh, by anyone other than Dane. Obviously, Dane has a position of power over her. She doesn't feel like she can say no to him, so he is raping her. And other than that, I, I'm not sure if I would say... I mean, she probably doesn't feel like she's allowed to withhold consent, so, yeah. And ultimately, it doesn't really... I've, I've seen a few reviews that actually basically blame her and use some really nasty words about her. I mean, I guess the movie basically... Like, there at the end, you know, she graduated... I guess she's valedictorian, huh? Because otherwise, she wouldn't be giving the speech, right? So, yeah. You know, so it's saying that if she focuses, she is indeed capable. But it basically, yeah, I mean, it is essentially saying that if a young woman wants to be successful, she's going to have to not be very sexual. And that's not, like, sex is a major part of life. It's not, you know, obviously you don't let it take over, but... There, there, it's not wrong for her to, I, I forget, I'm not 100% certain, I, you know, obviously if she is not of age, she is not able to consent, in which case it's all rape, but if she is of age, if she consents, then it's not wrong for her to have sexual relations, you know, whether she wants to have one or whether she wants to have multiple, you know, at most you can talk about, like, she should obviously, obviously be using protection. And, again, you know, cheating is wrong. But, yeah, I, I feel like the movie is basically saying, you know, she's either going to be sexual or she's going to be a valedictorian. And, yeah, it's just not, yeah. But that's, that's Hollywood for you. It's, sometimes it can be very conservative. And, okay, to be fair, not all Hollywood. Some Hollywood movies do have a more realistic and more relaxed attitude. You know, they're more sex positive. 
Now, I might swear in this video, just so you know, since there's, I usually don't swear in videos that don't, where the movie didn't have swearing. Instead of me quoting all the lines I love from this movie, let me just say here, I loved every line they put in the IMDb demo of the quote section. So you can just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. And I'll let you decide, based on what I say in this video, whether you think, you know, maybe some of them I loved ironically. Maybe some of them I thought were absolutely terrible. But they were definitely all memorable. And let's see. So, yeah. The IMD made more like this list, once again, comes up very short. So, the yeah, it compared this. To Formula 51 and Rules of Engagement. I mean, okay, all three movies have Samuel Jackson in a major role. I, I guess he's the protagonist. Oh, yeah, it's definitely Formula 51st. Oh, oh, yeah, is it 51 or is it 51st? I forget. But, um, yeah. Let's see. And. Yeah, so the. In my videos, I try to talk, both talk specifically about the subject and also the issues that it brings up. I try to have a good balance between the two rather than letting one of them overwhelm the other. I realize not everybody wants both of these. And also, I am a progressive and I don't keep politics out of my videos anymore. Now, I watched the movie just, you know, not just before hitting record because I recorded a video on my thoughts for WandaVision episode 3 before and that I yeah that's about an hour so but you know the the ah, what's it called other than that you know and I had lunch after watching but it's fresh in my mind fresh in my memory and yeah, so the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some is MSC, 3K, riff tracks, and other jokes, especially jokes in the first section. Time codes for all the sections are in the description box. And the first section, the, the section after this one, is thoughts that I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweet, and the like. Second section is thoughts that I had before watching, including, uh, let's see. Yes, and the final section, I get into stuff I think is worthwhile to get into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, MDB, and Wikipedia. And... Yeah, and I, I basically read everything that I could find on this. Every review, every YouTube video. Actually, yeah, come to think of it, I don't think I found a single YouTube video. Actually, wait, there was maybe one. I do think that, you know, I overall think the, you know, the movie gets wow in the, in the, you know, last, last chunk of it, but I do still think it, it deserves more discussion than it's gotten on YouTube as far as I can tell. Now, I will be discussing issues that don't affect me since I am not an ethnic minority. I'm not trying to lecture those that it affects. In part, I'm speaking to others who are not in those minorities, so we can better empathize with those minorities, and in part, I'm expressing my interpretation of the material without claiming that it's as valid as the interpretation of members of the minorities. Now, this is definitely a movie that does not have empathy for the least likable characters, and I can understand why it made that choice, but I don't think it's a very useful way to make movies about teachers and teaching. I think that that's going to just cause more division. Excuse me. And let's I do also want to say the the um, this is the kind of thing that I could really love. Yeah, at this point, I since I am spoiling the from an hour and three minutes in, it's basically a vigilante movie. You know, some have said it's like Death Wish. 
I haven't watched those movies. I know, I know, at some point I will get around to it. Basically, you know, what... You have two different movies here. You have a movie... You know, yeah, the first chunk of it is basically stand and deliver. You know, and then the second, the, the last half or so... I'm, I'm not going to be spoiling. I, yeah, I'm not going to be spoiling stand and deliver. If I do, I'll, I'll hold up an index finger while I do, and warn Berkeley before I do. But yeah, the first chunk of it is basically like stand and deliver. You know, it's it's a movie about a teacher who, you know, he's having trouble getting through to some of these, you know, students who live in, you know, bad neighborhoods and such, but he's trying, you know, he wants them to learn. But then the, the last chunk of this movie is a, a vigilante movie, you know, he's, he's going around taking revenge and intimidating and killing those who intimidate and kill. And both of those, you know, I... I remember really, really liking Stand and Deliver. I, I'm not sure I've watched it more than once, so the fact that I can still remember it is very impressive. It's, it's been maybe 10 or 15 years since I watched it, and again, only watched it once, so... But the... let's see... Yeah, Vigilante movies, you know, I... The... the there are a lot of Vigilante movies that I really love, and... Yeah, I, I'm not sure I'm going to give... Okay, yeah, as, as a quick, you know... Among others, I really love the 2004 Punisher movie, which is also a movie where... Not spoiling anything here, where there's some very brutal... You know, the, the protagonist does some very brutal things to the, the people that he's taking revenge on. Now, let's see. That is pretty much... Yeah, so I... I've watched this... You know, I, I wrote a text review of this in 2010. I may have watched it earlier, but... Other than my viewing today, and the initial viewing, I've watched it two or three times. My making jokes on this should not be taken as me thinking that, you know, me wanting to make light of a serious subject. And it may or may not be because I think that the thing I'm making a joke about is a, you know, bad aspect of the film. But yeah, you know, I find it very difficult not to endlessly freaking overanalyze everything I watch. And that is it for this section. So notes taken while watching. So yeah, once again, from here on out, there will be at least some jokes in the video. It is legitimately creepy seeing all the 187 pages. Garfield, if I had a dollar for every student who threatened faculty, what, you could buy new books? Very creepy with Garfield walking down the empty hallway. And skipping ahead to when he comes back from, you know, and he, it must be really embarrassing walking to the wrong classroom. And Dave does take it really well that Garfield walking into the wrong room. Honestly, when I think back to his early scenes, it doesn't really make that much sense that he is, like, I mean, yeah, near the end of the movie, it feels like he's been getting drunk on the job, and he's got these weapons in this Death Wish fantasy, and he's had sex with Rita for a while now, but here, early on in the film, he seems, I mean, did the, did, did the screenwriter forget how he wrote the character in other scenes or what were there usually was his character originally two different characters and then you know they had you know, for some reason they got combined and uh, yeah i have no idea but it really doesn't yeah are you done
there it is. And Benny throws the, the wad of paper at Garfield, and we can tell that Garfield has PTSD about the stabbing. And, and Dave talks to Garfield and says they have to play hardball with the students. Since this was written by a teacher, I have to assume that when Dave says that, you know, Garfield asks him, why do you still teach? Same reason you do, for the paycheck. The, the screenwriter presumably means, well, Dave has to have some job so that he can pay for food and rent. But some of the reviews, people took it to mean that he's a dispassionate teacher who's making big money, which tells me they have no idea how low teacher wages are. I, I, I suppose hypothetical. Okay, you know what? There are some people who make money off of like, like if if you want to make big money in that, you you would have to be like, you have to be one of the people who give like lecture, like ah, what's it called? Not lectures. Like, if you're going around and giving expensive paid speeches, that can make you a lot of money. But teachers, I don't, high school teachers, and I think probably also college professors, don't make a lot of money. I think they should. They have a really hard job. Cue the conservatives saying that, oh, you know, well, if you raise teachers' wages, they're gonna you, you're gonna attract some people who don't actually care about teaching who are just there for the paycheck which is funnily enough not what they say when the rich want tax cuts then what they say is that if you don't give them tax cuts they're just gonna go overseas and you're gonna lose a lot of american jobs and that's not even really the company's fault which is just look if you have a company that say if you don't give us money then we, t we, we, you know, we fire a lot of Americans. Um, that's called extortion, and that's against the law. So if, so if a company says to you, I know that that's not how it usually pans out, I'm saying it should pan out like that. If a company says to the government, if you don't give me money, I'm going to fire a bunch of people, well, you take some of their money and then you f f force them to keep those, you know, yeah, to, to not fire them. And then if they do fire even a single person, you, you know, they should have to pay a huge fine. And if they fire two people, you know, double the fine, not just another, but, you know, increasingly and just, yeah, there's, there's no, it is unacceptable for people who make an extreme amount of money off the hard labor of other people to whine about how they don't get to keep enough of it because they have to pay taxes. But to get back to the movie, let's see. Yeah, you know, we see Benny shoot the tagger and then we see the cut off ankle bracelet. So, you know, you want, later when we see the, the, that Benny is dead, you know, that's supposed to be like, you know, oh, well, it's, what, what, let me think, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And, which, I, I forget who said it, but an eye for an eye leaves the world blind is, I, I think, is a good way to respond to that. And, let's see. The writing that gets Ellen to see the stab wound is pr sorry stab wounds is pretty contrived. I 100% believe that these two would eat dinner together, but why would he dip her like that when she has a glass in her hand? And why was she dancing with a glass in her hand like these? That's I I really don't like I I guess maybe if like she was like if her character was an alcoholic, like they you know. I don't, I don't mean any offense to alcoholics, I just, I'm saying some alcoholics just usually are, you know, have, have a drink around. They, they just feel more comfortable like that. I'm not judging. But 
there's no way her character is an alcoholic. Even a functioning alcoholic is not. No, no, she is way too, like. Excuse me. She's definitely. She's more functioning than a functioning alcoholic. Let's go with that. Was the movie being racist when she said that she couldn't understand what Benny's mother was saying? I can't quite figure out if it's like supposed, if it's like the screenwriter basically saying, this is America, we speak American. And like that kind of thing. I mean, I, I feel like it would make a lot of sense for her to know at least some Spanish since so many of her students are Spanish. And she's been teaching there for a while. I don't know. I'm, I'm not judging. And I think we're supposed to take from, you know, it, it seems like Cesar can't read. It doesn't seem like he's too nervous to read aloud, but yeah. And then we have that thing. I'll, I'm not going to claim. I, I, will, I don't think I will ever understand why so many, you know, students from from school up to and including high school they both think it's funny when someone is disrespecting the teacher but they also think it's funny when it turns out that the student isn't as good as the teacher would like them to be like it's it it kind of like oh, sorry when the when the if the student is being disrespectful for the, for the teacher the students will laugh at the teacher but if the student isn't, like, if, if they can't do the work that the teacher's asking them to, then the other students laugh at that student. It's just like, I f don't, don't you have to pick one of those? Like, it, it just, it's never made any sense to me. I think I, did I already say I have a lot of empathy for students? It's crazy how much we're expected to learn in school. And I'm not going to claim that I was, you know, some, some stuff I was good at, but some stuff I wasn't. And Cesar steals Garfield's watch, and Garfield, you know, takes it to the administration, but it doesn't lead to anything. But then, you know, he manages to get it back with the, through the locker. And he... He films at least one lesson of class... And that's the lesson, you know, it's possible he films more than one lesson, but he definitely films that lesson where Cesar comes up to him and they discuss how Cesar stole the watch and he got it back by searching his locker. Like, so it's on tape. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense for that. Yeah. Because both of them confess. Like, it's not like Garfield says, I don't know what you're talking about. It turned out I just misplaced my watch. No, he literally says, "Yeah, I took your watch back from the, you know, from your locker, because and but if you say that to anyone, then you'll have to admit that you stole it and put it in your locker. But you're on tape. Say, why would you do that? Why would you say that on tape? Like is yeah. And Ellen catches Garfield not listening to her, so she compares San Francisco to Baghdad and Mars." And and Garfield tries to help Rita with the failing essay. I appreciate that, you know, like, Rita taking her clothes off is, like, off-screen. So, off, yeah, off-screen. So, it's like, either it's a surprise or you kind of see it coming and you're kind of powerless to do anything. You worry about the reaction that Garfield is going to have to it. Yeah, and we see Garfield set up the CCTV camera. Or, sorry, that's not what it... I guess it's not that kind of... Anyway, that's what I'm going with. And, you know, first we see it from the POV of the CCT camera, and then it goes into, like, close-ups, and it's still CCTV quality film. I feel like if that had gone on for much longer, I would be like, okay, that's that's enough. You can wrap that up. You're cute, you're clever, you can apply a filter, we get it, move on, but I don't think they push it too far. And Garfield confirms what the audience suspected. He did get his watch back, 
And that was why he was smiling when driving before. And we're told that Cesar has been stealing money from his mother's wallet. He has as little respect for her as he does for those who work at the school. I'm not going to lie, I found it extremely messed up when his mother confessed to sometimes wanting her son dead. That's... I, it's, it's getting to be a list. I also have a lot of empathy for parents, and there are definitely, you know, sometimes it can be extremely difficult. But I do think there's, I, I actually feeling like it would be a good thing if, I mean, it's basically the movie giving him permission, isn't it? It's saying, look, even his mother would be, you know. And we see that the classroom has been really messed up and Dave snaps at the student. And Garfield confronts Cesar and they threaten him. And Garfield is driving. Ellen snaps at another driver. We see how he's starting to lose his temper and they found the dog hanged i do really understand wanting to hurt someone who abuses animals that's but still the actions that garfield takes are not defensible and yeah basically a lot of what i have to say about the movie from an hour and three minutes in i say in the next section like i said in the review i would so I have to admit, I remember the needle and arrow being much smaller. I mean, that size, it seems like it should have done more than just, excuse me, drugged him. It could easily have badly, excuse me, hurt him. I mean, I seriously, I thought it was going to be like one of the, those tiny little darts and he like blows through a pipe. Did he have, like, we, we never see it, but did he, was he like straight up like proper bow and arrow, like... That is, and, and like, there's no, I don't think they ever at any other point mention that he's a skill, you know, skilled with a bow and arrow. I guess that's because they, they like just a little bit of, of, you know, plausible deniability that maybe it wasn't it. Obviously it's him. Doesn't he actually confess at the end? Of the, I think he confesses there at the end of the movie, right before the Russian roulette actually. But, but yeah. I'm sorry, but if you've ever tried to fire a bow and arrow, you know it takes practice. It's not, you know, maybe the movies make it look easy, but it's it's legitimately something you need to practice if you're going to be good at it. And it's never mentioned that he that he is good at it. Honestly, if he was good at it before being stabbed, I would think he would need to spend a while retraining the whole thing. It's just... I don't know why they didn't just have it be that Cesar looks in one direction and then he turns back around and like, you know, maybe, yeah, and, and he starts to take a few steps away and then suddenly, like, s someone jabs a needle in his neck. I mean, you can have it be like a hand with a glove on it so that we can't see if, if you badly want to hide the, you know, the appearance of the person doing it, but, but that... Bow and arrow. Wow, that's ridiculous. It's not quite as ridiculous as, like, nobody's going to get this, the coroner, but in that movie, it was at least a small dart. Actually, come to think of it, I'm, yeah, that scene is much more credible than, than this. Like, I know that the ending says a teacher wrote this movie. I'm guessing he doesn't teach archery because he doesn't seem to know enough about it. To, or I don't know. Maybe it was. Maybe it made sense in the script, and Kevin Reynolds butchered it. Actually, come to think of it, maybe it was in the script. It was a tiny arrow, and Kevin Reynolds was like, 
Ooh, I get to fire more arrows at characters, because I like doing that in Robin Hood. And don't get me wrong, in Robin Hood it made perfect sense. I'm not saying there were too many, you know, shots with arrows. It, it's it's Robin Hood, of course there are going to be some of those. And they, they did a pretty good job. It's, it's, a, it's a reasonably fun film, you know. Like I said in the review, I still prefer the 1938 version of Robin Hood. But I realize not a lot of people are going to go back. I think maybe the, the animated Disney one from like 1973, I think I might like that one better than the, the Prince of Thieves, I think it's called. You know, the 1991 Kevin Costner one. But it's been a while, so I don't remember. But not going to lie, it's the, the Prince of Thieves one is not my favorite. And Cesar is sitting there with his fingers sewn back on, and Garfield is telling all the students to wiggle their fingers. I also feel kind of bad for that, like, I, I don't know what it's called, but the, the woman who gets, like, the, the envelope handed to her, and she opens, and the finger comes out. I mean, that poor woman is going to be, like, really upset about that. She didn't do anything. Like, hypothetically, maybe he should have put it in Cesar's locker. Because Cesar's going to check the locker eventually or something. But it really, like, that woman did nothing to deserve the, the trauma of seeing a cut off finger. I think I also actually remembered it as the finger being next to him when he woke up. And Garfield literally spells out that people who do wrong things. Oh, actually, yeah, sorry. Before that. We, you know, Ellen seems kind of creeped out by Garfield now, and Garfield literally spells out that people who do wrong things are not a product of their environment, and that he hates hip-hop. I'm not saying there's something wrong with anyone hating hip-hop, regardless of ethnicity, but it's pretty clear that the movie is literally just stating what you're supposed to take away from it, you know. I mean, he comes, he comes just short of saying, I hate hip-hop. It makes students be disrespectful towards the teacher. You know, no, it's. Let's see. Stevie has an utterly terrible poker face, and Ellen emails him right back, sending him to the principal. Like, he he looks so guilty. Like he might as well be. <laughs> like he's he's. Just this short. Just the, the, the tiniest, tiniest little fraction short of literally pulling a, a Fletcher Reed and going, It was me! You know, it's it's ridiculous. Just look at the way, I, I don't think I can really imitate it, but he just, he looks so guilty. And it's just like, this is the, this is the badass gangsta who's going to shoot Garfield at the end of the movie. It's just... And Benny's dead body is found. Ellen informs Garfield. And Garfield says Benny was no angel, which is literally exactly what conservatives say every single time a black person shot by police. There was less focus on that back in 97, but this part of the movie has not aged well. Why did Garfield take the rosary? If he had just left it on Benny, it couldn't be tracked back to him. I guess it's like a trophy, but... Boy, was it stupid of him. And Ellen is clearly very upset about the stuff Garfield has been doing. She puts her hands on her head and screams, I don't know who you are anymore. And Garfield threatens Stevie. If Stevie thinks that Garfield killed someone... Why did he confront Garfield alone? You know, obviously it's because they didn't want the scene to involve more than one student. It just it makes no sense. The moment that he's done, he walks right out and goes goes up to Cesar. Like, what was the point? And why wasn't it Cesar who confronted? I guess the maybe they they felt like, wow, we we really didn't give Stevie very much to do in this movie. Let's give him some more. And at the end of the movie, he graduates. So he, you know, one scene he's he's literally didn't. Yeah, I th I think he literally threatened Garfield. I I think he said, "I'm gonna kill you for killing Benny." 
And at the end of the movie, he graduates. That's... wow. I love how people say that this is the realistic movie. That not everybody. Some some I'm not the only person who says that it's ridiculous with the whole death wish angle, but there are actually people who say this movie's way more realistic than those other movies where the the idealistic teacher in an urban high school makes the, the students turn into angels when they're, you know. I'm, I'm not saying which movies those are. I'm just saying some of the other movies about urban high schools are like that. I'm not saying, you know, obviously that's also ridiculous, but it's the part of the problem is trying to fit it into a Hollywood movie, trying to make, you know, a movie that's somewhere between 90 minutes and two and a half, you know, two, two hours or something, where, you know, some of the students start, you know, start out really disrespectful towards the teacher, maybe even ill educated and then end up really really like you know like he says not he's not hooked on chronic he's hooked on phonics you know just that it's not impossible but it's not very like a lot of the time that kind of thing doesn't happen and the thing is if if a movie like this ends with none of them graduating then a lot of people are going to be like well what was the point of the movie you know, it's it's a it's a lose lose kind of thing. You know, it's it's very difficult to make a very realistic you know depiction of this kind of thing. But this movie is not the realistic alternative to the movies were. But that's the thing. I mean, it's I think when you read other people's reviews of this, it really reveals a lot of people do feel like those who threaten with violence or commit violence should be treated with violence themselves, you know, as if that's going to solve it, you know, the, the, I mean, the movie basically says, well, with Benny and Cesar gone, and with Garfield proving that he's, the, I mean, what does he even, pro yeah, he, I guess he proves that even if he, I will teach you something if it kills me, you know, usually when a teacher says that, they're not talking about a game of Russian roulette, but, I mean, it's just, it's so silly, it's so hard to believe and yet there are people out there who say this is this is exactly how to you know if, if you don't believe me just read other reviews they literally say you know that yeah man not gonna lie for a second there i thought no one was gonna try to defend rita when cesar and the uh, you know cesar is literally physically assaulting her but we do see there are a few people who try to do it, but Stevie and someone else pushes them away, you know, keep, prevent, physically stands in their way. Yeah. And they have that, you know, I, I don't know what it's called, but there's like a, you know, there's a bunch of parents sitting and there's school staff, screw, crew, staff, not screw or calf. I forget what they're called. Yes. So the the you know, but Benny's in the Stevie's in their back in the back. Benny didn't come back from the dead to haunt them, but Stevie's there shouting that Garfield was the killer of Benny. And Dave approaches Garfield and is like, "How about a ride home? Come on, my kid is home alone." And but Dave shows Garfield all his guns. I guess Dave is supposed to represent what Garfield might eventually become if he keeps going the direction he's going. But then the movie's on his side, though. Maybe it's saying that Garfield is in the right, because look how much worse it could be. Garfield may be a vigilante, but at least he's not Dave. I mean, obviously, Dave shouldn't be getting drunk at work. He shouldn't be fantasizing about shooting students. He shouldn't be having sex with Rita. And unless he has a license for those guns, he shouldn't own them. But Garfield actually did do violent things. He didn't just fantasize about them. I think I read at least one re reviewer who said that they, they thought that that scene with Dave showing the guns is supposed to make us think that he's the one who cut off Cesar's finger and killed Benny. But, you know, it, it yeah, it clearly doesn't. I mean, I'm not sure the movie would lose anything if you just removed that scene and 
yeah, it really it feels like a complete double standard. Like, well, look, other other teachers are thinking about doing it. That doesn't make like it's this weird thing where conservatives are, you know, it's if a conservative says something and all you have to say to respond is two wrongs don't make a right, then obviously it's not a very good argument. Like, yeah, there are, I'm sure there are students to teachers who imagine, you know, who would love to hurt their their students. But that doesn't mean that a teacher actually hurting their students is in the right. And and honestly, what if the movie just ended with Garfield admitting that he had crossed the line, admitting that he was uh, like Rita says that they they put you know the the other some of the other students pushed Garfield too far, and that's you know so at least the movie does acknowledge that you know it didn't come out of nowhere, but it's still like. I mean, I guess the movie is supposed to be, like, a warning. Like, if the, you know, if, if students keep pushing teachers, eventually this will happen. But that's not exactly... Huh. I'm sorry, one second. That's why that thing was wobbly. There we go. Now, let's and Cesar sits and watches The Deer Hunter, and the movie takes another page from the big book of how conservatives explain violence in America, and implies that if you watch violence in films, you're going to want to commit real-life violence. And let's see. And Garfield gets fired over the allegations. And yeah, I talk about the... Let's see. Yeah, Rita at Garfield's home in the next section. Let's see. Yeah, I just really briefly want to say, hypothet you know, if someone watches The Deer Hunter and wants to imitate Russian the Russian roulette scene, don't you think it's worse if they have access to armed guns than if they don't? I've watched that movie several times. I have never wanted to play Russian roulette. Ah, sorry, that uh, that's that's a fallacy. That is, I forget what it, I used to remember what the fallacies were called. I realized that me saying that I don't person, what I'm saying is, people all over the world has watched that movie and seen that scene, and yet. When someone commits, when when someone actually does play Russian roulette and ends up dead, oddly enough, it's usually in a place with lax gun regulation. Very strange that. And they carved one eight seven into Garfield's car door with the car key, and prepare to kill Garfield, shaving their heads. And the camera moves around Garfield and managed to unsubtly put the cross in frame for several seconds right there over his shoulder. Again, like, I guess we're supposed to take it that God would approve? I don't think Jesus would approve. Although I guess that's, yeah, to be fair, the, the Jehovah Witnesses would have you you know, believe that God would 100, that Jesus would 100% yeah, I, I guess they're going for a, a an Old Testament God, and to be fair, he was very eager to, to kill people. You ever see Deer Hunter, Mr. G? The screenwriter for this movie has probably has probably more times than he should have. Not sure he took the right message from it. And we see the graduations. Again, I, I talk about the Russian roulette in the next section. We see the graduation ceremony, and Evidently, Stevie did stay in school and even graduate, so seeing two people shoot themselves in the head made him really hit the books. You know, I think we can all learn a lot from this. I guess, really, what we need is more Russian roulette in schools. Come on, man, this is ridiculous. Just, like, if, they, if the movie had just picked one, like, hypothetically, let's say that without the gang members in class, that meant that the other students did end up focusing more on class. But Stevie is one of the gang members. You know, it doesn't make any sense for him to... 
And Rita gives the speech and says, not only can you say that people are shaped by their environment, but, you know, if someone pushes a teacher hard enough, they do snap and start killing students. And Ellen quits. My version of this movie does not show the stamp, the, the, yeah, right before the end credits that I've read other people say that they see. You know, the only thing my version says before the end credits roll is a teacher wrote this movie. So, someone removed it from the credits. I, you know, I'm not sure if they thought that made Garfield look right or wrong by removing. I mean, certainly if they're there, it makes it seem more understandable why a teacher would snap. But without them, yeah, I, I don't know. Let's see. Yes, so... Right, yeah, the movie is an hour and 50 minutes without any credits, and 54 with them. And that brings us to the next section. Notes taken before watching. And let's see. Yeah, so I'm not going to be. I know that Kim Morell's directed Waterworld. I'm not sure I've actually seen it. I, I know I've seen at least a little of it, but yeah, it does indeed sound like it's. I mean, I feel like is it maybe just that it wasn't really what people expected or wanted, and so not enough people went to see it. I'm not sure it's actually that bad of a movie, but they did, like, it ended up costing a lot of money, and, excuse me, I will just briefly say, part of the reason it cost so many money, because that, so much money, is the fact that they decided to actually film it out you know, they, they didn't want to just build a, a big water tank and film. No, they want, and, and use, or maybe use green screen or such. They, they went out and, and just the, the, of course that's going to make it cost way more and be much more difficult to make. And that's just, that's a really bad idea. I don't know what compelled someone to actually why would you make that decision like that yeah anyway let's see so yeah the the writer you know former teacher scott jagerman who wrote this has done almost nothing else i haven't seen any of it and it doesn't look like it's been particularly well received and that brings us to Yeah, and John Hurd, I think this this is one of the only things I've seen him in, but R.I.P. Peter McAllister. Oh, right, yeah, I had seen Kellerone and a couple of other things. I just don't know that they're... That is her in Candyman, Phil Oats of the Flesh. She's good in that, too. Yeah, she's... Come to think of it, doesn't she play a teacher of an urban school in that one, too? Did she just, I guess it's it's probably just a coincidence. It's not that she just like cornered the market on young white woman who teaches urban high school. Anyway, and yeah, Clifton Collins Jr. or Clifton Gonzalez Gonzalez as he's credited here. Yeah, so Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Think High Voltage, Green Star Wars, Andreas, Rules of Attraction, The Last Castle, huh? Traffic. Fortress, wow. That one's on the list. I will get to that one eventually. It'll just be a while. I have many, many DVDs that I want to do videos on. Yeah, and the cinematography was done by the same guy who did Daredevil and Payback. Yeah, I can I can kind of see some of those in, in this, yeah. 
and the editor also edited Three to Tango and Cuffs. I don't know. I don't remember enough of those, uh, especially not the editing side. Anyway, if you skip to here in the video to hear about, you know, what happens from an hour and three minutes in, I will, just, you know, let me just briefly set up how we get to the last chunk of the movie so that what I say doesn't sound completely like nonsense. And yeah, sorry if you do know what happens. I'm going to try and make it brief. Over the course of the movie, Garfield, Garfield keeps having trouble with Benny, leader of the KOS, or Capping Off Suckers gang. And yes, I do think that them using a K instead of a C is supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be like, oh, they can't even spell, they're so stupid. You know, the, the, yeah, Benny and another student, a fellow member of the KOS named Caesar, and yeah, they, you know, they disrupt class, they, excuse me, you know, the, the yeah, they disrupt class, threaten Garfield and others, and at one point, you know, they are, are members of the game, some of them, kill a, a dog, the, the dog that belongs to Garfield's fellow teacher, Ellen, who have talked about also having been threatened before. And what happens next will shock you. What happens next is what pushes the movie into ridiculous territory. Garfield murders Benny, making it look like an accidental drug overdose, and drugs Caesar, and Caesar wakes up missing his trigger finger, which, you know, he, earlier in the movie, he, like, did this to, like, threaten, you know, I'm gonna shoot you, and so trigger finger cut off, and part of it is also that he's wearing a ring on school property, which is, what was it that he said? I, I forget, you know, basically, Garfield was saying, you know, it's gonna distract from class or something like that. I, I don't know. I guess they have a dress code and it's outside, whatever. But yeah, you know, we see that, yeah, he, he's, he's, yeah, Cesar wakes up missing a finger and he, he gets it back real quickly, but it was, you know, he's missing a finger and yeah, it, we, we never see it, but it's, I, th I think Garfield, by the end of the movie, said, you know, confirms the finger was indeed cut off by Garfield. You know, assault and mutilation. And when it comes to Benny, murder, which is something that could immediately destroy Garfield's future. But you see, he had to make, oh, sorry, he, Cesar doesn't have that finger anymore, so he had to make a point. Ah, oh, sorry, that looks like acceptance, and I guess I can't do that without the finger. See, it's just, it's such an important finger, so it's just, you know, may, maybe maybe he, he points too much, it's, you know, he had to make a point. Similar to what, you know, some people do in low-income neighborhoods, you know, will, like, write individual letters on individual fingers. He wrote across the finger, are you done, which is something that he's said when he really wants to shut down disruption of class. And teachers in real life do use that phrase. It's a pretty good way to shut down a disruptive student since you're refu you, know, you as the teacher are refusing to give them the reaction that they want. You know, the, they want you, you know, basically the disruptive student wants the teacher to yell at them. They want to get a rise out of them. So when the teacher says, Okay, you got more, you know, come on, I, you know, so, so, yeah. But by using the phrase to punctuate cutting off the finger, and I realize this is by far, this is nowhere near the biggest problem with this movie, but you do risk ruining it for teachers. And I guess if anybody had watched this movie, which, you know, it has ridiculously few reviews, you risk ruining it for teachers since students might claim and they might mean it and there's some chance that it would be realistic that that phrase feels threatening to them. And then the movie ends with, you know, the the gang, you know, yeah, with, with Cesar forcing Garfield to engage in Russian roulette. 
and you know Garfield points out all the harm caused by the macho lifestyle. Cesar breaks down, saying it's all he has. Garfield takes his turn playing Russian roulette, shoots himself, and then Cesar plays his turn. You know, takes his turn playing Russian roulette, and he shoots himself also. And yeah, it's I I you really don't see it coming before the the you know once the movie makes that turn then it's like i didn't think we were going here but i guess we are and look at us go <sighs> i had actually forgotten like i i showed the movie to my father i guess by now it's been a year or something and i had forgotten that it ends as a vigilante movie i remembered I think I remember the the I, I remember the Russian roulette, but I didn't remember cutting off the finger and killing Benny. I think my mind just kind of blocked that out because I was like, this makes no sense with the rest of like it's it's just like it's it spends all this time trying to explain what a good person Garfield is. And then you think that maybe that's going to mean, you know, I'm not saying the movie has to end with him making these students, you know, into perfect students. But maybe, maybe he should quit there at the end. And that could help inspire Rita to do better because she had a really good teacher, even though he left. And maybe you could have the movie end with him getting a job where he is respected you know and yeah then you would be saying some you know some places teachers don't get respect but it's not impossible some people are willing to show them respect but as it is i mean you kind of just have to take it as the former teacher screenwriter basically i guess warning us that if students keep disrupting class eventually someone's going to snap you know, a teacher's going to snap and start killing students. It's just, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get more into that. But briefly, I'm just going to say, obviously, I'm aware that there are other school teacher vigilante movies. It's just that if, if some of the others, you know, this is the only school teacher vigilante movie that I've watched that doesn't start out seeming like it's going there. You know, it's it's another thing entirely if your movie starts with the premise that this is a teacher who kills students, you know. I realize that using a piece of fiction to live out your revenge fantasy is, you know, obviously it's preferable to living it out in real life. And like I said earlier in this video, I 100% empathize with the problems that teachers face. But making this movie risks making things even worse for teachers. I mean, if you think that students are already disruptive, you really think it's going to make it any better if some of them are looking at you worried that you're literally going to assault them? And again, it's just like, I I think it's the, it, there's, that, there's that quote. I think you're mistaking peace for quiet. And it is basically like, I don't know. I'm not saying that Scott Yeagerman has done something wrong. I imagine if he had, it would have been like someone who had watched this movie would have checked into stuff that he'd been involved in. I don't think he's done something wrong. I think it would have come out if he had, but I can't help but wonder if this movie is like he's, he's basically saying that he would prefer for his students to be afraid that he's going to assault them, maybe even kill them, as long as they're at least quiet, then if they don't fear him, but they're disrupting, you know, I just, I can't imagine wanting people to fear for their safety, for their life. I, I would, I would be mortified if I found out that something I had said or done made someone else feel threatened. I just, yeah. Anyway, a teacher wrote this movie is in the end credits at, at the start. One man deserves the credit. One man deserves the blame. Seriously, no shit, Sherlock. It's a power fantasy for teachers. Who would write it except for a teacher? 
one of the problems is that the movie doesn't really offer altern any alternative to what is going on. We get a pretty good speech at the end about how teachers deserve more respect than they get. That's absolutely true. But it ignores that there are already many cases where threats to people are not taken seriously, including by the police. More respect for teachers is not the sol the whole solution. It, part of it, yes, but not the whole solution. And obviously dangerous students need to be taken very seriously and dealt with. But then clearly some of them do also need to get an education. How are you going to get them out of gangs if they can't get a proper job? Frequently those who end up in gangs specifically don't have many other options. If you, you know, I don't know what I'm supposed to think that the movie wants done about them. Should all of them have a finger cut off reattached? Should all of them play Russian roulette until they die? That is one of my big problems with movies like this. They frequently don't seem to understand that in addition to teachers deserving more respect, gang members do also have problems that could be solved by the government. I'm not saying that someone who commits violence deserves as much respect as someone who doesn't, but then the movie does appear to understand that if you push people hard enough, many people can end up committing violence, even though they used to hate such an approach. The movie comes so close to realizing that there's another problem here that needs solving, but it doesn't quite get there, because it's too excited by the idea of vigilantism. Imagine if, like it is now, early on in the movie, the school administrators do not take threats that Garfield is getting seriously. But then later, when things get worse, they do take them seriously, but then the cops don't take them seriously. You know, thus pointing out that that's another problem. It, for sure, it is a problem in the real world that school administrators don't take threats seriously enough, but a lot of the time, police don't take threats seriously enough. And thankfully, some teachers do understand that students have problems too, such as the excellent YouTuber Grappling Ignorance, himself a teacher of, you know, I, I believe it's also urban, yeah. I won't say that it's disturbing, and it definitely isn't surprising. It definitely isn't surprising just how many of the reviews, especially by MDB users and such, say that it's a good thing that Garfield goes vigilante. But I do think it helps show why we shouldn't have power fantasies like this. Why instead we need more movies that bring up more realistic solutions and state all of the real problems. A lack of respect for teachers by students and school administrators. Worrying about lawsuits are only part of the issue, as I've gone into in this video. Let's see. And real quick, I wanted to say, before I continue on, ah, that was the thing. Okay. There was something else that I was going to say, but I have a hard time remembering. Let's see. I mean, ultimately, the, those, you know, the movies where, after a while, the teacher does manage to inspire the students to learn. I'm not saying that you can do that with all students, but that is more realistically the solution. Like, I mean, Rita, I guess it's because she's no longer, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't see any other way to read the movie than saying that with Benny and Cesar gone and with Stevie not an not an active member of the KOS Rita you know nothing's keeping her from I'm not saying clearly she's smart enough but I just the problem with some people being discouraged from learning is not to kill the people who are discouraging them that's ridiculous. That's, but the the movies where it ends up with the teacher managing to inspire the students, I mean that is actually how when when education goes well, it's because students are inspired, not because they're afraid, you know. And that and I don't, I don't think this movie understands that. I don't think the people who made the most important decisions while making it, understand that. They seem to think that a teacher should be feared, and if the students don't fear him, maybe he should start doing something that, you know, that could make them fear him. You know, it just... 
honestly, I, I figured the next student, sorry, the next teacher who would take over would probably be very scared of of students. Maybe he would play hardball like Dame was trying to tell Trevor. But yeah, you know, some of some of the IMDb reviewers and such will even say they appreciate that this movie isn't unrealistic, like movies similar to it where ultimately the teacher is able to get through with the students. And don't get me wrong, I'm not telling you what you can and cannot like. I'm not saying that every young person who makes for a difficult student can become a good student, much less just by the strength of the material they're being taught or how passionate the teacher is. But let's please not pretend that the solution realistically is a bunch of vigilante teachers. It's a power of fantasy, one that some people find appealing. At least one of the reviewers that approved of the vigilantism was apparently written by an actual teacher, so here's to hoping nobody pushes them too hard, I guess. The movie implies that people like Benny are dangerous to have in the classroom, so the implication must be that they should be in prison, I suppose. There are some who would say they're too dangerous, so we should execute them like Garfield himself does to Benny without a trial. I'm only briefly going to go into the problems with capital punishment here. We haven't seen a clear case for it working as a deterrent. It's been proven that rehabilitation is possible, and if you want to be cynical about it, you know, Rehabilita rehabilitation is less expensive than capital punishment. And I will briefly say this movie was made after the 1990s crime bill, which actually made it a lot easier to give long prison sentences to people, even for smaller infractions. So it's very irresponsible to put this movie out after that bill has passed, basically saying that law wasn't enough. So at the start of the movie, we meet Mr. Garfield, devoted teacher, hates Mondays. I like the detail that Rita assumes that Garfield offering tutoring wants sexual favors from her. She doesn't even ask, she just assumes and undresses because in her mind, why would a man show her positive attention if it wasn't for sexual favors? And meanwhile, as others point out, it's hard to believe that Garfield would be naive enough to invite a female student to his home. I'm not gonna lie. The This thing of a teacher inviting a young female student to his home and then rejecting her sexual advances and being fired over it. It kind of feels like someone trying to justify why they're not really having sex with that female student they've invited home with them as a teacher. I'm not saying, you know, again, I don't think the screenwriter himself did that. I on, honestly, if he if he did that and like if he had some sort of inappropriate relationship with a female student and then he wrote a movie where basically, you know, I mean, the movie is basically saying, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't do anything wrong here. You know, I, I don't think they probably would have removed it from the movie if, you know, and it would be super easy. It would be extremely easy to remove that scene from the movie. So I just, I have to wonder if maybe he knows a teacher who did. And, you know, he doesn't believe that they had sex with the female student. And this is him trying to say that kind of thing is just innocent. It doesn't mean that the teacher is having sex with their student. And just, it's it's very hard to believe that someone would be naive enough to not. You know, I, I realize it's, it's text. The movie itself is saying Garfield is that naive. Clearly, you know, ev everything in the movie points to him being you know, to, he, he wasn't trying to have sex with him. And for anyone who might wonder why Garfield simply doesn't leave the LA high school once he realizes how dangerous it is, a lot of teachers don't really get to pick and choose. They have to take the jobs that are available to them. I do have to admit, I think the, the numbers franchise is a bit of a mess continuity-wise. I mean, what does this movie have to do with nine and a half, three hundred? 1408 or 1492 it's just it's all over the place the, the continuity is very vague and let's see. yeah so the yeah there's a youtube video uh, yeah other than the trailer i only found one youtube video that said why you should watch 187 and it's it's a you know it's worth watching that video
but yeah, he says, you know, the, yeah, at the end, Mr. Garfield stoops down to their level because, you know, the threats he receives from them are not taken seriously by the superiors. And yeah, the trailer, it's, it's good, but it does basically give away the twist. And, yeah, I found a trailer that's 2 minutes and 28 seconds. I found one that's 2 minutes and 21 seconds. It's the same trailer. It's just that thing of, you know, maybe there's a, some, uh, what's it called? Some black screen there at the end for 7 seconds. Or not. And that brings us to the final section, which is called Critic Sites, MDB, and Wikipedia. And I have 100 and 42 notes. So let's see. The, yeah, so this is. Let's see. This is Ebert. It feels like the movie lost the nerve of its original story impulse and sought safety in elements borrowed from thrillers. Its destination doesn't have much to do with how it got there. As a social problem picture, 187 is a great music video. Excuse me. Yeah, here's a, here's a review where he says, this film's method for reaching a moral is rather outrageous. Yeah, here we go. The film starts off like most educational urban decay stories, but halfway through, it quite unexpectedly becomes a death wish vigilante story that, while entertaining, also seems wholly inappropriate concerning the sober tone the rest of the film takes. And let's see. The film needed more lines like, you don't need to worry about the gangbangers, you need to worry about the teachers, and fewer heavy handed allusions to the deer hunter. Now, Reynolds want us to believe the ends justify the means, but the end of the movie couldn't come quickly enough. Frustrating to watch as a teacher, as it could have all been avoided. Now, let's see. Now, the movie was written by Scott Yeagerman, who taught seven years in the Los Angeles public school system, and you can feel the rancor and bitterness he still carries. And the person gave it a 50 out of 100, Edward Guthman of the San Francisco Chronicle. And yeah, it, it does, it feels very bitter. Much more bitter than realistic. And let's see. Artistically pretentious, thematically fuzzy, and almost sinister in its very deterministic view of the human condition, this unusually ambitious and serious-minded major studio release 
is simply too negative in every possible way to find a receptive audience. Tom McCarthy of Variety gave it a 50 out of 100. Yeah, that, that might be the, the reason that it didn't... You know, people don't really remember this movie. People do remember Dangerous Minds and Stand and Deliver and such. Now, let's see. The prospect of a teacher driven to a student's level of sociopathic vengeance might have packed a ghoulish wallop had the film viewed it as tragic. Reynolds, however, is just grinding out exploitation thrills. Absolutely true. I I mean it's I I I don't like to read negative things into how people but it's it's hard to read this movie as anything other than the screenwriter and director both really thought that it was cool, that it was deserved when Garfield starts, you know, mutilating and killing people. And, yeah, I mean, let's see, this was, I forget if he had already put out Waterworld when this movie came out. Let's see if I can really quickly find... And the director? Yeah, he had put out Waterworld and Robin Hood. I don't know enough about, let's see, Count of Monte Cristo, Risen, Hatfields, and, well, Hatfields and McCoys. I know the, the like the original, I don't, I don't know that movie, but. I think it might be that he just, when he does, oh, he did the Red Dawn remake. Oh, wait, no, sorry. He wrote the Red Dawn remake. I mean, I could imagine that he just, when he sees that, when he sees vigilantism, he automatically sympathizes with the vigilante, whether it's Robin Hood, Mr. Waterworld, sorry, Detective Waterworld, Sorry, couldn't help it. Or Trevor Garfield, you know. And let's see. A ham handed melodrama that trivializes an important topic the role of the teacher in a violent classroom. Jackson bears the weight of the film in a constrained, introverted role, terrorized, pertinacious, innocent, passion squandered. But a grand resolution and some melodramatic twists and set pieces undercut the hard-nosed tone. One eight seven, the title refers to "Cop Speak for Homicide," circles round and round, never making a salient point that isn't countered by another utterly opposite notion three scenes later. The most disheartening thing, so dis disheartening line in one eight seven is its last, written in bold type across the screen just before the credits roll. A teacher wrote this movie. It's enough to make you weep, and not just because it's painful to think that this muddled and manipulative film was penned by someone in a position to mold impressionable minds. By the time the movie's ugly conclusion is reached, we are so numbed by the mindless degradation of it all that we couldn't care less who wins. We know we didn't. Right, so this is IMDb Trivia. 
Nicolas Cage and Gary Sinise were considered for the role of Trevor Garfield. Yeah, I could see that. I think they would have done well as well. And yeah, and so, like I said, I'm not going to quote the lines, but I will just briefly, you know, yeah, Trevor yells, your whole way of life is bullshit, macho is bullshit, and Cesar responds, it's all I got. If a regular teacher confronted a student and pointed out that macho is bullshit, that would be one thing, but Garfield has by this point stooped to his level that, that Cesar and Benny were at. It's really hypocritical of him to, at this point, still be saying that macho is bullshit. Obviously, that's what he believed early in the movie. You know, he doesn't say it, but it's clear that that's what he believes. But at this point, it's ridiculous for him to still be saying it. At least he does admit that it's really stupid of him to kill himself just to teach Cesar a lesson. But it just, like, I mean, there are several times where he says... I used to love to teach, and they took that from me, and I miss it. You know, I'm not who I used to be. They robbed me of the, you know, so there is some level of understanding there, but then, you know, the movie is more interested in these, you know, this where it's saying, you know, the, the, yeah, it just, it, I mean, maybe if it maybe it would help if Garfield said, maybe you can see that macho is bullshit by me doing macho, so you can see it from another perspective or something. I I'm not sure the movie realizes him, like I don't know. I guess I guess maybe it's not macho, but it's it's still you know he's he's not. Like, if Ellen walked into the room there at the end and told all of them, but macho is bullshit, then it'd be like, yeah, she's got a point. Because she hasn't done anything macho. You know, the the closest is when she, you know, catches Stevie emailing her the, the expletive-filled email, or it's emailing all of them the expletive-filled email, and she emails back. I wouldn't really call that macho, it's just that's, you know, she responds to it in the way that she should, you know, she sends him to the principal's office, that's, you know, but Garfield has no leg to stand on here. Are you willing to die for your stupidity, Cesar? Because, you see, I am, if it'll teach you something, and you thought that your teacher was dedicated to teaching. And Ellen gives Trevor a cactus as a gift and tells him it flowers. If you gave Jean Carteau more than one cactus and a feline owned by one of the two broke girls accidentally got cut on it, would it be that Carteau's cat eye cut cat's cute cat? You, you can't give me an opening like that and not expect me to... Yeah. Let's see. Oh, and sorry, I, I realized I just touched my face. I washed my hands since the last time I was out, and I am not, you know, I'll, yeah, I am very careful about Corona. Now, let's see. Yeah, so the original screenplay was written in, uh, real quick, I think this is from Wikipedia. The original screenplay was written in 1995 by Scott Yeaman, a Los Angeles, high, Los Angeles area high school substitute teacher for seven years. He wrote the screenplay after an incident when a violent transfer student had threatened to kill him and his family. Yeagerman reported the threat to the authorities, and the student was arrested. So, right there, well, I mean, you could easily have made that part of this movie. You know, it could just have been, like, you know, so, so the, in real life, a similar thing did lead to the arrest of, yeah. 
About a week later, he was called by the district attorney to testify against the student in a court of law. The student was being prosecuted for stabbing a teacher's aide a year before. Samara Jägerman, who had not been told about it beforehand, led to him writing the screenplay. He claimed that 90% of the film's material is based on incidents that happened to him and other teachers in real life. Boy, I sure hope that some of the last 10% are the vigilantism. I gotta admire the dedication of writing the number 187 on every page of the textbook. Let's see, so, right, that brings us to reviews that, oh, right, sorry, real quick, I wanted to say, yeah, so, I tried to look at, like, other, you know, I, I saw on Wikipedia that this is listed as a hood film, so I went over I haven't watched that many of them, but just briefly, these are listed on Wikipedia as hood films, and I've watched them. New Jack City, Pulp Fiction, 187, He Got Game, The 2000, Shaft, not one of the others, Training Day, City of God, 8 Mile, Never Die Alone, Coach Carter, American Gangster, and Street Kings. But yeah, so there's going to be some reviews that I found by going to the IMDb, you know, external reviews page. And I tried copying in, there were only 34, that's really not a lot. I've, on some of these I found like 100, 150 or something. Now, let's see, the yeah, for example, I think the... I think there were a lot for John and Mnemonic, for example. Anyway, yeah, there were 34. I'm, I tried to copy in all of them, but I only got 20. The rest were dead links, languages I don't speak, etc. Let's see. Guess that Yeah, I thought this was a, a quite good. The close confines of the cramped, oppressively hot classrooms creates the perfect atmosphere for this film. Shot in an impressive, almost always moving style, Reynolds uses the camera to create moods, though at times, um, sorry, the other film is off for shots, might have audiences thinking something's wrong with the projector. Yeah, that was the thing I was trying to remember. That was the, yeah. And let's see. I 
guess that might be I apologize for the dead air. There's a lot of this that I don't really see. One Eight Seven is obviously meant to be a serious movie about America's educational crisis. Watching it, you get the feeling that One Eight Seven's director Kevin, I know Kevin Costner, Reynolds woke up every morning and said, I am making the most important film ever today. The end of 187 reminds the viewer that an ironic ending has to be earned. It just can't be slapped onto the film. And, right, and from here on out, it is IMDb user review. 62 things that I noted that I want to talk about. Let's see. So, let's see. I thought this was very interesting. I read the um, remarks above and was struck by the notable lack of comments about one of the defining qualities of this film. It is a modern Hollywood treatment of an old, old story. A story that was already ancient when it was packaged a couple of millennia ago as the New Testament. This is the story of a good teacher who is moved by compassion to sacrifice his own life in order to demonstrate the folly and absurdity of man's inhumanity to man. This story has been told and retold again and again, with varying degrees of success. The Green Mile is at one end of the spectrum, and Cool Hand Luke is at the other, which, when is up, is, I suppose, a subjective thing. What makes this movie... What makes this a good movie is its subtlety and ambiguity. Okay, it's not always that subtle. The introductions were a bit of a groaner, and he, yeah, he writes out that Dave Childress, yeah, I'm just going to read it. Roosevelt High, isn't that where that teacher got stabbed to death? Actually, he survived. No, there was this gangbanger had a ten-penny nail. He stabbed him about a dozen times in the hallway and, long pause, you're him. Jesus Christ, you're him. It was you. But at least his initials weren't J.C., Giving him the surname of an assassinated president is a little more elegant, though. although points come off for finding it necessary to reinforce the synchronicity of it by having him glance up at the list of American dead presidents when he realizes he's accidentally walked into Childress's American history class. One thing's for sure, Samuel Jackson sure knows how to give to Cesar what is Cesar's. A great screenplay, brilliantly photographed, excellent sound design. The ambiguity of Garfield's moral character is interesting to me. He's never shown to do anything wrong, with the exception of yelling at someone in a road rage incident, but there are some implications of wrongful behavior. Even these implied actions are ambiguous. 
to the circumstances justifying them. The writer clearly wants us to think about it hard. And 15 out of 18 people found the review helpful. Let's see. And yeah, you know, honestly, reading that makes me like the movie more. But I do think that the movie would be stronger if it had taken the moral high ground and Garfield never actually did do anything wrong at all. Now, let's see. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm just briefly going to point out, I remember reading at least one reviewer that says that they thought, it, they, they really hated that Ellen was disgusted with what he did, with, with what Garfield did, and I mean, just try to imagine if someone you knew actually did things like that, and not, not just a movie, but it actually, yeah. Let's see... Let's see, I gotta look quick. Uh, yeah, this story about a teacher challenged in a school full of dangerous and poor delinquents is set in Los Angeles, which is fast becoming for urban misery what New York was 20 years ago. See LA and die. Except that in this movie's panorama views, you can't quite see the city because it's encased in smog that approximate the true, approximates the true color of nitrogen dioxide. If LA were a duck, it would be a duck orange. That was, that was very, very good. I, yes. And let's see. Now. As this film demonstrates, teaching is one of the most underrated, undervalued, underappreciated, and underpaid of the public service sector. That is unfortunate for our children and the progress of our society. By the end of the film, as we see Garfield creating a rationale no different than his adversaries for his unforgivable actions, we can no longer sympathize with Garfield. There is also the stark contrast between Jackson's character and Kelly Rowan's character. The difference between the two is that Garfield creates his own rules in a system he feels will not work with him. Rowan's character works within the system to make things work. This is subtly exemplified when she is faced with a racially charged email from one of her students.
187 suffers one major flaw. Many of the actions are unbelievable. As a picture written to be satirical, that would be okay. 187 does not make any overt jabs at society or light comic criticisms to make it worthy of being a satire. Yet it dares to step the line of over-exaggerating many of the characters' actions to make a point. It would come off better if the focal characters were more believable, making it a more realistic depiction of problems in urban, school, urban schools. It would also work if perhaps all aspects were over overtly exaggerated to create a surreal, darkly comic atmosphere. This would create a full-fledged satire. 187 does this sometimes while at other times taking itself too seriously. This is confusing and makes the overall message less effective. Excuse me. I, I like this. This is this is an IMDb review. This is the the their one one line summary. The following comments were written by a real movie patron. Jackson's an admiral. Right, 187 is a well-done, almost beautiful film that has some major flaws. First of all, it is nearly impossible to sympathize with any of the characters. Jackson is Jackson's is an admirable man who goes psycho. His love interest is not well developed enough. Sorry, developed enough to have any kind of emotional impact on the audience. And all of the students are portrayed as ignorant, depraved, and downright evil. The film perpetuates racial stereotypes and instills a fear of the urban poor without offering any solutions or any deep investigation of the root of the problem. Also, some of the dialogue is a little trite. The controversial ending was not exactly satisfying either. Surely the same point could have been made without, while being consistent with Jackson's character. As it is, he made a comment here that was antithetical to everything we'd seen up to this point. It kind of negates everything he was. Oh, here it is. Though I didn't understand why she is disgusted with Jackson when she figures out that he kills Benny, the obnoxious kid who keeps on harassing her. I, I really, you, I guess I, I, I guess maybe this is a person who hasn't experienced death in, you know, the death of someone she knows. Even if you don't like someone you know that there's still like it's it's a very natural thing to be to find it really like yeah to to be upset when someone dies especially when someone kills someone and again is like it would be one thing like hypothetically let's say that Benny had been arrested and for some reason he ended up being released for some reason, he, had, you know, they, they just couldn't get him by, you know, by using the law. But the movie really doesn't explain why, like, hypothetically, let's say that we buy the movie trying to sell us the idea that 100% for sure there is no way that Benny, like, if, if they, if no one kills Benny, if, 
if he isn't executed by the state and he isn't killed by a vigilante, then that's a problem. You know, there's a there's a huge problem with him still alive, which morally reprehensible point of view, but okay. That's what let's say that that's it's yeah, that probably is what the movie is saying. So okay, that's what the movie is saying, but it doesn't explain why he isn't just a he just killed someone. We see him kill someone. Why wouldn't they just have it be that he was like I mean, I could at least understand if they like hypothetically, let's say that they tried to do it the law abide you know, they, they got him arrested, but then the case was thrown out because the let let's say that there's some corruption on the force or something. Some explanation I I realize that that would mean they'd also have to deal with that you know they they would probably have to devote some more time to that but as it is just the movie doesn't explain why would the even if we believe that he has to die why does it have to be vigilantism why can't the we see him kill someone we like he's actually yeah it's it's just Anyway, being a teacher myself, I was interested in how he was dealing with the situation. If there would be some kind of message for teachers and or the kids. Well, unfortunately, there was none. So I can't really recommend this film, though I like the first half very much. It's not a gang movie, it's a drama about problems being faced in areas that have many gang members. It's always a nice topic to discuss and make people take notice of. A lot of the problems in these areas, in and out of the classrooms, have to do with the fact that many of these kids can't get the educations they need and deserve. Thank you. I really, I, I wish there were more reviews like that, but way too much, yeah. Um, two students, though, are seemingly beyond saving. Benny Chacon and Cesar Sanchez. Benny, a murderer, winds up dead. Cesar, a dog killer, winds up with a finger missing. Mr. Garfield is the culprit, though there is no evidence of his involvement. Yet, based upon the most tenuous of evidence, he gets linked to both crimes. First, his girlfriend, played by Kevin fellow teacher, notices a rose in his drawer that must belong to Benny Chacon, because no one on earth owns a black rosary except Benny. To help solidify her strong assumption, she goes to the morgue with Benny's mother to help identify the body. Even if I conceded that the school was a good place to look for a missing child after four weeks, it was sheer production convenience that Garfield's girlfriend will be there to assist Mama Chacon. And it's, it's true, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it's not like, it, it would at least be something if the rosary was found with a teacher who wasn't Christian, but we know that Garfield is Christian. He prays, he has a cross on his wall. I'm not saying there's something wrong with that, but I'm saying the fact, the idea that he wouldn't himself own a rosary, like, why not? Fully convinced that Mr. Garfield is a killer, Ellen, the girlfriend, confronts him. Garfield neither confirmed nor denied the accusation. As for me, I didn't care one way or the other, but knowing he took the life of two lost and violent souls, I also knew Hollywood had to kill him. And...
This movie was tragic for tragedy's sake. Almost done. This is slightly amusing. The teacher who was attacked in New York in a yearbook, oh, sorry, find a yearbook with the number 187 written on it. This leads him to believe that his life is being threatened because penal code 187 is supposedly murder. The problem is, in New York, penal code 125 is murder. In California, where he moves, penal code 187 is murder. Using that code in New York is a serious factual error that detracts from the overall quality of the writing and research that goes into a credible movie. That's very true. I mean, I guess we're just supposed to... I, I think the... the character the, the school administrator act, character actually says they heard it in a rap song so I guess that's how we're supposed to say it. but yeah it is like I think they, the the screenwriter maybe forgot that part let's see Kevin Reynolds made solid, turbid, and dismal atmosphere out of the story by using a lot of elements to express such a dreadful experience. For instance, you'll find so many red, blood, blue, grief all over the screen, or varies between sick yellow, gloomy black, with a hot image in a sweat all the time, like the teacher and the students are both in one cell and no one will let the other live. Oh, hold on. Though that desire was important, important to the extent that you may feel unfortunate, I forget what that means, to the extent that you may feel, especially with drastic events and that Russian roulette, and that the movie nearly sunk under it. Although I believe... Uh, yeah, and it says, while the movie's title, 187, is P California Penal Code section, which defines murder, the movie itself nearly murdered its own message. And that was actually everything that I noted. I think that is everything that I have to say about the movie at all. But yeah, just really quickly, I want to say I don't think I would have made a video on this movie at all if not for the whole Death Wish thing. The once the sorry, did I already say that? Thanks. You know, it's just so it's such a ridiculous. If the movie had been from the start that kind of thing and if yes yeah, especially if there was more like yeah and the the yeah I think I've said everything I, I think the movie would have worked better if the the vigilantism thing had been you know if they had gone there sooner and maybe if it was like the the let's see yeah I, th I think it really needed to I I guess the idea is supposed to be that the reason that they can't use the law the the let's see there's that one, I, th I think it's Benny, 
Benny is apparently the, you know, he, he already was, excuse me, he was convicted for something severe, excuse me, and they put him back in school as part of his, like, as part of the uh, arrangement afterwards. I, I forget if he actually served a sentence or if he maybe is the idea supposed to be that he goes to school and then the rest of the time he has to be at home, hence the ankle bracelet. And I guess that's that's what's supposed to be. So, you know, if the if they released him, then it's impossible to put him back. It's just, he, yeah, and the, yeah, and, and, you know, he does, Garfield does try to talk to the administrator, <laughs> and the administrator says that the kids might sue, and that's supposed to justify why it's impossible to get police in on you know what? Something that might, hypothetically, let's say that Garfield talks to the police and, like, maybe maybe they say, I mean, our hands are tied, you know, we can't do anything in this particular instance, but then, like, one of the cops, like, approaches him and he's like, it has to be off the record, but I really want to help you. You know, and so they set something up where, like, the police officer is, yeah, may maybe, like, the one, maybe there's one cop, and he's going to try to arrest, like, three gang members. And so he he draws his gun and, and is like, you know, okay, all of you, you know, uh, put, put your hands on your heads, you know, and, like two or all three of them, you know, grab their guns, and though the cop manages to shoot one of them in self-defense, you know, the other two manage to shoot him. Then, you know, at that point, yeah, and then if, especially if the, if somehow the, yeah, okay, it would be ridic completely ridiculous if the, somehow, that still wasn't enough for the police to, to like, arrest these people. But then, I, as an audience member, I'd still not think it was okay to kill, you know, Benny. But at that point, I would be like, okay, I, now I understand why it's not enough just to go to the police. You know, you, you really have to... If, sometimes I'm amazed at how many American movies act like police don't exist or that they have no power. There's this... It's this strange cognitive dissonance where like a lot of regular americans are convinced that if the police do something violent then whoever they did it to must have deserved it but at the same time like the you know yeah at the same time a lot of americans a number of conservatives will be like, well, the cops aren't the boss of me, and I should be able to, you know, threaten them and get away with it. And, yeah, I feel like this movie, like, I get that I, I am, I can, I can tell that the movie thinks that it is necessary for Benny and Cesar to die, but I cannot figure out why it feels that the police can't be part of that. Why it wouldn't make more sense for that to be... Yeah. Now the... Let's see. Yeah, it just... It really needed to explain that instead of, you know... But, but yeah, so, you know, in class... You know, the, the, um, ah, I forget what it's called, but yeah, it's like, it's like a morphine, ex it's, it's similar to morphine, you know, and, uh, Garfield demonstrates that he can, 
you know, that, that you can use this particular formula or the rule, law, something. Now the movie's not, doesn't really believe in the rule of law, but, but the, yeah, that if you f follow that particular thing, then you can determine how much, you know, how much morphine is okay, and he gives the mouse a certain amount, and just as he said it would be, it was fine, he didn't kill the mouse, even though, you know, the, the students say, oh, you, to you totally killed that mouse, you know, but yeah, he says, I, you know, this is my own, you know, I guess he's still in pain from the, from the stabbing, I, th I think that might be right, you, you have, you know, the, the human body has a lot of nerve endings in places where, like, boy, it would be nice if we didn't have quite as many, and one of the, yeah, the, the place where he was stabbed, you know, we, we see his stab wounds, yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's true that you would feel a lot of pain for a very long time, long after, you know, I mean, obviously, the, they've healed, the, the, superficially, I mean, the, the cuts themselves, he's not bleeding during the rest of the movie, but, yeah, I think it's very realistic that they messed up some nerve endings in there, and he's still in a lot of pain, so he still, ha which is obviously why it was written like that, you know. But yeah, so he has that morphine, and that's the morphine that he drugs Cesar with, so he can cut off his finger, and it's what he forces Benny to OD on, you know, because we know he can, he can determine how much is the right dose, because he explains that formula, you know, so using that formula, he made sure to calculate what would be way too much, what would be enough to, and I think morphine, I think that is one of the things you can OD, like, I mean, uh, let's see, uh, technically speaking, you can OD on anything, you know, anything that has, like, a strong, like, any, anything that qualifies as any kind of drug, but some things, if you OD on them, it's not gonna, like, actually, yeah, is, is marijuana, I, I don't do marijuana myself, but I'm, you know, I don't think it should be illegal, you know, alcohol actually impairs, you know, has a, has a worse effect on, anyway, the, the, yeah, I, I'm not sure if you can, wait, yeah, the thing was, it's almost impossible to die from using it, or to permanently hurt, like, yeah, it's, it's that, anyway, yeah, I'm almost certain morphine is one of the things that if, if you take way too much in way too short of time, it, it does kill you. So, you know, that aspect of it, you know, the writing there is realistic enough. And the movie does do the, the footwork of explaining, like, hypothetically, if you took away the scene where he, you know, explains the formula and, and gives the morphine to the, the, mouse and all that, then you have, then, then this, you know, we, then we haven't been explained something very fundamental, you know, you have pieces of the puzzle missing, that would be a problem, and as it is, the movie has other problems, but it doesn't, I don't think it really leaves any pieces of the puzzle missing as such, but yeah, let's see, was there anything else that I wanted to get into? I guess that might have been all of it. And I have been going for a while now, so I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching, although not necessarily for the reason that the director meant it to. And I will catch you next time.